Now, you have to be careful, just because a car is wearing a luxury brand name, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's a high quality product. Like sure, it might nail all of the lovely, touchy-feely, subjective stuff, like having a sumptuous leather interior, all of the tech in the world, and it might make the roads feel like they're made from clouds, but often under that classy and sexy bodywork lays a whole bunch of pretty ordinary mechanical parts, and some of those parts often just don't last the distance. Plus, being a premium brand, sometimes the parts and the labour to fit those parts can cost a small fortune. So, what are some of the very best luxury cars that also might bite you in the financial ass if something were to go wrong? How about we start with something British? To be more accurate, let's talk Jaguars, and we're talking about the stunningly beautiful XE and XF. Now, the majority of XFs on the Aussie used car market are of the initial 2008 to 2015 X250 generation. And the XE, well, it's been around since 2015, and it's technically still a current model. And both are arguably ideal examples of perfect car design, both inside and out. Both offer exquisite driving experiences, loads of tech and features, and maybe because they're not an Audi, a BMW, or a Mercedes, they offer a unique alternative compared to the more predictable German offerings. And thanks to the typical immense depreciation that luxury cars suffer from, they do seem to offer incredible value for money. Early XFs, well, they kick off from as little as $10,000 here in Australia, with the sexy-as-hell post-updated supercharged six-cylinder variants even asking less than $40,000. That's a luxurious rear-wheel drive sports sedan for around about the same asking price as a new Corolla. Whereas these slightly smaller and more recent XEs, well, they kick off from around about $25,000, with the very best used examples asking well under $80,000. Look, it is a premium over the XF, but as we found in our full review video, it is a very special car. However, the other thing that we covered in our full review videos of both of these cars, are there concerningly long lists of common faults and issues? Jaguar and sibling company Land Rover often place at the very bottom of the list when it comes to reliability. In fact, this year, Jaguar came 25th out of 32 brands in the JD Power Vehicle Dependability Study. They ended up in 26th spot out of 32 in Watt Cars Survey, and they finished third last in Repair Power Survey. Now look, we thoroughly cover many of the common problems in our full review videos, so if you are still tempted to buy one, maybe you should watch those videos first, because it, it can be a little bit confronting. And next up, let's head north, I think northeast from the UK, and head to Sweden. Yep, it's Volvo. In particular, and as we're talking about luxury cars, it is the exquisite 2017 to, well, still current S90, and its near twin under the skin V90 and V90 Cross Country siblings. Now the XC90, it could do with a mention here too, but the thing is we're going to be covering off awesome but risky luxury SUVs in a whole other video. Firstly, Volvo can seemingly do no wrong in the design stakes of late. Basically, every model the Chinese-owned Swedish brand produces is a masterclass in cool, understated design. Design. Then, thanks to Volvo being one of the less predictable European brands, the levels of standard equipment and even the materials used for the interior, they often surpass the big three Germans. So it is very disappointing to see a brand like Volvo, which has long prided itself on safety and reliability, finding itself amongst the lowest scoring auto brands when it comes to reliability surveys. The brands that consistently top the reliability chart are constantly innovating and evolving their current power plants, while Volvo have all but given up on their current petrol and diesel powered engines and drivetrains, focusing almost completely on electrification. And this shift in focus has seen even the most recent ICE powered vehicles suffer from some pretty major reliability concerns. Now $35,000 to $60,000 might not seem like a lot of money for what is a genuine luxury car in the S90, but as these cars warranties run out, we question if it's worth the risk and potential financial outlay to fix any inherent issues. Okay, next up, and speaking of electrification, funnily enough, actually, before we get to that, if you want to buy a luxury car, well, it's going to require some pretty intelligent financial decisions, like maybe finding a finance package that both saves you money and suits your specific needs. If only there was some sort of online service that was super easy to use, had no hidden fees, and could give you pre-approval in just minutes. And imagine if that same service gave you $150 worth of free fuel if you maybe clicked on the link down there. Well, you know what? Maybe hit that driver link down there because there's a bloody good chance that it provides all of those things. But there's another smart financial decision that you should be making, and that's not spending a fortune on OEM wiper blades or buying aftermarket ones that just do a crap job. 
Instead, hit the WiperTech link down there to get 15% off some of the very best wiper blades we've ever used. Guys, they're easy to order online. They're gonna be express shipped to your door for free. They're super easy to install. They'll fit perfectly and they'll wipe like you wouldn't believe. Now, as we were saying, speaking of electrification, Okay, this next one's gonna be controversial. It is the awesome, but very risky, Tesla Model S. While the Model S isn't commonly thought of as being a pure luxury car, it does technically fall into the luxury car category. And look, fair enough. It has a modern and relatively luxurious interior. Thanks to the electric drivetrain, it's obviously very quiet. It's loaded with equipment. It's very comfortable and it's large and practical enough to give a real sense of presence on the road. I'll also argue that it offers a completely unique driving experience. So like, love it or hate it, it's pretty hard to argue against the fact that the Model S, it does tick most of the luxury car boxes. However, as is commonly reported, and as even we found in our full review video years ago, the Model S can be absolutely riddled with issues. We're talking embarrassingly bad build quality, panels that simply don't match up, the retractable door handles, they often fail, the bodywork itself, it can have issues, there can be endless electrical gremlins, problems have been reported with the climate control, the steering, suspension, and there's even persistent alignment issues with the wheels, all of those things are becoming commonplace. Then there are reports of faulty electric motors that need to be replaced, warped brake discs, leaking coolant pumps for the battery pack, windshield wipers that won't wipe. Even the car we reviewed, it's had to have its headlights replaced multiple times and the entire interior has begun to squeak and rattle. Then there are plenty of reports stating that the large control screen can just fail. And this means that the vast majority of the car's functions simply won't operate. However, it seems that like no matter how bad things get, many owners, they stay loyal, ignoring reality, claiming that the Model S is the greatest car to ever grace the globe. And it simply isn't. Look, the Model S, it can be awesome. And if you're happy to pour money into it, well, yeah, look, that's great. But with so many issues occurring already, what condition will these Model S's be in in the future? And now that I've risked my life daring to criticize a Tesla publicly, how about we move on to another brand that has an incredibly loyal and passionate fan base that also sometimes happen to avoid certain realities? Yep, it's the Alfa Romeo Giulia. Stunning looks, yep. Incredible driving experience, check. Sexy and alluring image, 100%. On the surface, the Giulia is a completely intoxicating car. All of the charm and romance that comes with Alfa Romeo, nailing that balance between performance and luxury, no matter what trim spec that you're looking at. Plus, thanks to depreciation, the Giulia, it seems to offer excellent value for money on the used market. But this is where the issues can often begin. See, the reasons that a used Giulia can be a risk, look, it actually has less to do with the car and more to do with the previous owners. Mistreated Julias that haven't been properly maintained can be an absolute world of trouble. And thanks to how well they drive, many owners, they do tend to push them constantly. And look, this isn't necessarily a bad thing as long as the car is properly maintained. But the issue is, many owners fail to do that. With a Julia being so gorgeous, fast, special, and now somewhat affordable, these are all attributes that appeal to, well, let's say enthusiastic owners that don't often have an abundance of money. And it's also really important to recognize that many Julias have been acquired via a lease arrangement, with owners having absolutely no intention of keeping the car for the long term. And with parts, labor, and fastidious maintenance for an Alfa Romeo generally being pretty expensive, many examples on the used market rarely get the attention that they deserve and require. So in the end, you end up with cars that have been abused constantly without proper oil changes or regular service or repairs. And that's on top of the commonly reported issues with the Julia's electronics, leaking cooling systems and oil consumption issues. And cars that fall into this category, well, look, of course, they're going to be unreliable. And look, yes, Alfa Romeo, they have improved their reliability by leaps and bounds, but they just simply aren't as resilient to abuse or a lack of maintenance when compared to many other brands. And the same can be said for one of its siblings, but we'll get to that car in a second, because before that, I have to say thank you. Guys, Redriven has become one of the fastest growing automotive YouTube channels in Australia, and it's all because of you subscribing and supporting us. The more of you that support us, the bigger and better and more videos that we can make, and we cannot thank you enough for your support. Honestly, we appreciate it more than you know. Thank you, thank you so much. Also, before we get to our next car, would you guys like to see a part two of this video? Because the research, it flagged a whole bunch of other awesome but risky luxury cars. Do you want to see what they are? Let us know in the comments if you'd like to see a part two. Anyway, the final car for this video, it is the 
God, I love these things. It's utterly gorgeous. It is the Maserati Quattroporte. No other car encapsulates a sense of luxurious Italian charm and romance like the Quattroporte. A decade on, the big Maserati, even in its like earliest base form, is still an utterly gorgeous car. To many, it's quite possibly the most attractive of all of the world's large luxury cars. But it's not all just good looks either. Under that perfectly sculpted bodywork lies genuine Ferrari DNA, often nailing that balance between relaxed luxury and passionate performance. Plus, these days, you can get behind the wheel of an early base model for as little as $20,000 here in Australia. It is incredibly tempting, isn't it? Well, it is until you recognise some of the realities, because the lists of common problems on these is honestly terrifying. See, Maserati fell under the Fiat Chrysler banner, which is now called Stellantis, and as is well reported, these guys, they're not exactly the poster child for build quality and reliability. And unfortunately, it certainly shows in the Quattroporte. We're talking major electronic issues like faulty sensors and malfunctioning control modules to complete electrical failures to common but more minor but still infuriating issues like sporadic warning lights, unresponsive infotainment systems, and power windows or mirrors that just cease to function altogether. Then there are the gearboxes that can shift roughly or just delay engagement or just completely fail, resulting in huge repair bills. Many owners have reported that the suspension can become noisy and excessively rough thanks to prematurely worn out bushes, dodgy shocks and struts, or just misaligned suspension components from the factory. And then we get to the sublime engines that are sublime when they work. Yes, there might be Ferrari DNA deep inside the heart of these things, but issues like rough idling, engine misfires, reduced power to complete catastrophic engine failures, they have been reported, and far too often. These symptoms can stem from faulty fuel injectors, electronic failures, ignition coil issues, cooling system failures, intake leaks, rubbish engine bay plastics, all of which point to excessive cost cutting during manufacturing, and all have made for a laundry list of reliability issues with the Quattroporte. And then add to this that many on the used market have missed services and crucial maintenance, or owners, just like Maserati, seem to have cut costs during the life cycle of the Quattroporte. So for us, look, yes, it's gorgeous, but it's just far too much of a risk. But would you still buy one, or actually would you buy any of the cars on this list? Also, if we do a part two, what cars should we put in the part two video, on the part two list? Anyway, see you guys next time all of the tech in the world and it might make the roads slow down, slow down, slow down. Well it is until you maybe recognise some of the realities because I've got to scratch my nose. Top of Tesla Model S, okay. I feel like that, that was the Mercedes. A Mercedes doing weird mechanical things. It's not uncommon is it? What was that?